The Kingdom of Sweden has been famously neutral for most of the last two centuries. But even though the country managed to stay clear of big conflicts of the 19th century and remained largely neutral in World War I, its government still had to account for the possibility that Sweden might go to war in the future. That's why, during the 1930s, the kingdom was just as interested in developing their military capabilities as its neighbors. Given the situation in Germany, it was pretty clear that Europe was slowly steering towards a new global conflict. In the beginning, Sweden bought most of its aircraft abroad. But then, there was a moment when they couldn't get enough P-35s from the US, and after it, the government decided to support domestic production and development of military aircraft, and Saab was the company that rose to the challenge. In fact, Saab engineers had been making aircraft since the early 1920s, just under a different name. There was a company called Svenska Aero, which was actually founded by Ernst Heinkel and Karl Bucher as a way for Germans to bypass rules imposed on the Weimar Republic to stop them from developing and manufacturing aircraft. In the following decade, the company changed hands a few times until it ended up as part of the ASJA conglomerate. During that turbulent decade, people at Svenska Aero moved from licensed production of aircraft designed by other companies to pursuing their own designs, like the Svenska Aero Jagdfalken, which you can find in War Thunder as well. This was a reliable biplane fighter aircraft that handled really well, but it was never produced in large numbers due to the company's limited production capabilities. After several business blunders, though, ASJA also had no choice but to be integrated into another company, Svenska Aeroplan AB, or Saab for short, which, in the process of the merger, also acquired ASJA's project to develop the L-10, light reconnaissance aircraft. Engineers designed several possible variations of the new all-metal monoplane aircraft, featuring different types of landing gear, including floats, and also gave it a dive-bombing capability. That's why, in 1937, when the government, which previously failed to obtain American planes, requested a new reconnaissance aircraft, Saab just had to finish what its predecessors had started. The new aircraft was soon accepted into service and assigned the designation B-17 for the bomber version. Different variants of this plane were used by the Army up to the early 1950s and were pretty popular with air crews due to their well-thought-out design and good flying characteristics. Apart from that, in 1944, the B-17 was joined in service by a new bomber, the Saab 18, which was intended to replace the German Junkers 86 used in Sweden under the designation B-3. Saab developed several variations of the Saab 18, including a strike aircraft with two 20mm autocannons but they, just as the original vehicle, were never tested in actual combat. The aircraft was in use up to the early 1950s, and that was the end of the story. Obviously, it wasn't just bombers that engineers were working on. Take a gander at the Saab 21, a twin-boom pusher and one of the most unusual vehicles designed by the company. One of the advantages of its unorthodox configuration was that it allowed guns to be carried in the aircraft's nose while still providing good visibility for the pilot. The aircraft was also easy to maintain and had a number of other strengths, but this arrangement was definitely tricky to design and the Swedes were the only ones who succeeded in mastering it in time. In the end, the Saab 21 became the one and only production piston-engine aircraft of this type. Nevertheless, the Swedish Air Force 
received a fast, agile fighter with decent firepower provided by a 20mm autocannon and four machine guns. But it was the time when the first ever jet fighters, the German ME-262 and the British Gloucester Meteor, were being accepted into service. Naturally, Sweden wanted to keep up with the times, so in 1945, Saab started developing their own jet aircraft on the base of the Saab 21 and with the use of the British de Havilland Goblin. The new plane, called the J-21R, was soon accepted into service in 1950, but it served for only six years. Despite the fact that the aircraft was heavily modified to accommodate the Goblin engine, with numerous changes, including a complete redesign of the tail section, the development was only a limited success. The aircraft had a max speed below 1000 kph and could carry very little fuel. As early as the late 1940s, though, the Swedish knew that the J-21R was only a stopgap solution. And so they invested heavily in the development of a new turbojet-powered fighter aircraft with a swept wing. The new plane, designated J-29, was developed by both Swedish engineers and German specialists that stayed in Sweden after the war. The aircraft was accepted into service in 1950 and served in a multitude of roles, including reconnaissance. The design had some weaknesses, like subpar handling characteristics at high speed and limited fuel reserves. So it was only natural for Saab to quickly shift gears to start working on the successor vehicle. The next model, the J-32 Lanson, was ready by 1955. Configuration-wise, it's a typical aircraft of the era, a single-engine jet fighter with a swept wing and a powerful cannon armament, the British Aden cannons. What made it stand out, though, was its versatility and brand-new American Sidewinder missiles, known in Sweden as Robot 24 missiles. During the 1960s, the Lanson and the J-29 were phased out in favor of one of the most recognizable aircraft of the era, the J-35 Draken, specifically designed to intercept bombers at high altitudes. Designing this plane was a very tough challenge, as the requirements for it were insanely high from the get-go. The requirements specified a top speed of around Mach 2, excellent flying characteristics and the ability to use the full range of advanced modern weapons including guided missiles. It was also required to operate from just reinforced public roads, because eh, why not? In order to achieve that, the team behind the project decided to go for an innovative but unproven double delta wing. It took them more than a decade to iron out the kinks of this configuration and make it work. But it was all worth it. The Draken became known for its many firsts. It's the first Western European combat aircraft with true supersonic capability to enter service. The first combat aircraft featuring a double delta wing. And the first ever aircraft to be capable of the legendary Cobra maneuver. The Draken remained in service all the way up to 2005, the last few decades, in the company of Saab 37 Vegan, yet another fighter aircraft which provided a testbed for innovative design methods and unorthodox concepts. It was the first canard design produced in quantity, and it performed really well. In fact, it was known for its excellent maneuverability and its great rate of climb. Apart from that, the Swedish Air Force used the Saab 105 light attack aircraft, available in several variations, including the SK-60B model. 
It was a highly versatile plane with lots of options in regard to its strike capabilities. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the way you look at it, Saab aircraft were almost never used in anger. Neutral Sweden, hell-bent on maintaining that position, avoided most of the wars and conflicts plaguing the continent, as did most of the countries buying Swedish planes. In War Thunder, though, Swedish aircraft are always ready to deploy. Do you have any favorite Swedish aircraft? Share your stories and experiences in the comments below, because we are hungrily listening.